Chapter Thirteen, America's First Ace. At the close of the war, ninety-four squadron not only held first place among all American squadrons in the length of service at the front, but we held the record in number of enemy planes brought down and the record number of aces for any one squadron as well. I believe no single squadron in the world has won similarly so many victories as the American 94 Hat in the Ring Squadron had credited to it during the first six months of its existence. Our victories, which were confirmed, totaled 69, ending with the last aerial victory of the war, that of Major Kirby, who shot down his first and last enemy machine just northeast of Verdun at about noon on Sunday, November 10, 1918. Many of the pilots who had gone out on their first patrols with me counted themselves later among the American aces. While many Americans had secured five or more victories in the air before the pilots of 94 began their full strides, these early aces, such as Loughbury, Bailey's, and Putnam of French escadrilles, and Warman, Libby, and Magoohan, who were enrolled with the British, all were trained under foreign methods and flew foreign machines. The first official American ace is therefore claimed by our squadron. This Simon Pure American air fighter, who entered the war with the Americans, received his training with Americans, and did all his fighting with the Americans, was Lieutenant Douglas Campbell of San Jose, California. Douglas Campbell was 22 years of age when he made his first trip over the lines. His father was the head of the Lick Observatory on Mount Hamilton, California. Douglas had received an unusually good schooling before he entered the war, being an old boy of Hotchkiss, and later graduating at Harvard with the class of 1917. The outbreak of the war caught him traveling in Austria with his family. They avoided the active theater of war by going through Russia and getting thence from Denmark to England. After finishing his college course, Doug began preparing for aviation by entering the ground school work at Cornell University. He was among the first cadets to be sent to France, arriving in Paris in August 1917. He had not as yet received any training in flying, but was thoroughly familiar with wireless operation, aerial navigation, and aeroplane motors. Made adjutant under Captain Miller, who was then in command of the American Flying School at Isledon, Lieutenant Campbell had great difficulty in extricating himself from this indoors work, where every day's stay made him more and more valuable to his superiors. He determined to learn to fly, with the expectation that, once possessed of his wings, he might find his transfer to an active service at the front more quickly obtainable. There were no beginner's training machines at Isidon. Only the 23 model Newport were there. Pilots were supposed to receive initial training on the slower Curtis machines, or the Cadro, before attempting to fly the fast Newport. But Campbell feared he would never get necessary permission to take this preliminary training, so he determined to get through without the beginner's course. Little by little, he edged his way into the advanced training school. He finally considered himself well enough schooled in the principles of flying to make his first essay on a solo flight. He went up all right, flew away all right, landed all right. In other words, Lieutenant Campbell learned to fly alone on a fast scout machine, a feat I do not remember any other American pilot having duplicated. Douglas Campbell was always a silent and self-possessed fellow. He was popular among his fellows from his first appearance in 94 Squadron. Quiet and thoughtful in manner and gentle in speech when on the ground, Lieutenant Campbell in the air was quite a different character. He went after an enemy pilot like a tornado, often exposing himself to deadly openings. His very impetuosity usually saved him from danger, unless his opponent was an old hand at the game and knew how to measure up the proper amount of defensive and offensive tactics in the same maneuver. On May 31st, the day after our big celebration just recorded, Lieutenant Campbell went out on a voluntary patrol alone, i.e., Doug went out looking for trouble. He made quite a long flight inside German lines at a great altitude, but discovering too many enemy airplanes aloft, he decided to return back to the lines. When still three or four miles behind the German front, he discerned a German rumpler machine evidently taking photographs of our advanced positions just south of Fleuray. Fleuray lies just inside our lines about halfway between Pont-de-Mousson and Saint-Mihel. The rumpler aeroplane was the machine used by the enemy for observation and photographing. It was a two-seater, and both the pilot and the observer who sat behind had machine guns so mounted that they covered both the front and the rear. The pilot's gun was fixed, that is, it lay flat on top of the engine hood and could not be raised or lowered. The pilot must raise or lower the nose of the airplane itself to bring his sights upon a target. The bullet shoots straight through the revolving propeller, and the trigger of the gun is so connected with the propeller shaft 
by synchronizing gear that the hammer of the gun falls only when the propeller blade is out of the way of the issuing bullets. The observer in the rear seat, however, is able to move his twin guns about and point them in any direction. An attack is therefore usually made upon such a machine from a position under its tail. If an attack comes from below the fuselage, the observer cannot shoot without cutting holes through his own tail. The forward pilot cannot use his guns at all. The only defense against such an attack is a quick swing to the left or right, so that the observer can see the attacking enemy and bring his guns into action. This move the attacking airplane must anticipate. Campbell was coming into the enemy's range from a very favorable direction. He had the sun at his back, and moreover, he was coming from Germany into France. His presence in that direction would not be suspected. Maneuvering until he was sure of his position, Lieutenant Campbell first tried a diving attack from above and behind the rumpler. He had an excellent chance of killing the observer with the first burst long before the latter could swing his guns around and aim them, but no such easy victory awaited him. As he began his dive, he began firing. Six or seven shots issued from the Newport's single gun, and then it jammed. The observer turned around and saw the diving Newport almost upon him. He quickly seized his own gun and got to work. Campbell was compelled to fly a wide circle away out of range while he worked the breech block of the Vickers and freed the jam. Now it must be a contest between a one-man scout and a two-man fighting bus. The best pilotage and the coolest nerve must win. As Doug returned to the attack, he discovered at once that he had a veteran pilot against him. The Rumpler crew showed no sign of panic or fear. The Heinies did not even propose to retreat. Campbell approached somewhat warily and began a study of the enemy's tactics. The new port could turn and twist with much greater agility than the heavier machine, it had greater speed and a faster dive. Underneath the rumpler was a safe position from which the American could keep out of view and occasionally point up his nose and let go a burst of bullets through the enemy's floor. Campbell darted in, braving a few hurried shots, and secured his position. But he didn't keep it long. With a skill that won from Campbell still greater respect for his pilotage, the German pilot suddenly banked over, giving his observer an excellent shot at the Newport below. There was no place to linger in, and Douglas quickly vacated. He dived again and came away at a safe distance. Again he turned the proposition over in his mind. These fellows were evidently desirous of a real battle. Well, thought Campbell to himself, let the best man win. Here goes. Circling the enemy again and again at such speed that no careful aim at him was possible, Campbell smiled grimly to himself as he saw the observer frantically continue his firing. At this rate he must soon exhaust his ammunition, and then Campbell's turn would come. Doug continued his maneuvers, at times firing a shot or two to tempt the Bosch into still greater activity. Round and round they went, the Hun pilot attempting to kick his tail around to keep pace with the quicker circles of the flitting Newport. The pilot was surely a wonder. The observer, however, was not in the same class as the air fighter. For fifteen minutes Campbell continued these maneuvers. So far as he knew, not a single bullet had entered his plane. Then suddenly he noticed that the pilot had changed his tactics. Instead of trying to keep the new poor within range of the observer, the German pilot was now keeping his tail behind him and sought always to get a shot himself with his forward gun. Campbell flew in closer to the tail to get a look at this situation. Coming in towards the observer from a diagonal direction, Campbell approached within fifty feet of the enemy and saw a curious sight. The observer was standing proudly upright, and his arms were folded. From the edge of his cockpit the empty ammunition belt floated overboard and flapped in the wind. He had indeed exhausted his ammunition, and now stood awaiting his doom without a thought of asking for mercy. He wore a haughty expression on his face as he watched the American approach. As Doug said later, he was so impressed with the bravery of the action that he felt he could not continue the combat against an unarmed enemy. The Prussian's expression seemed to say, "'Go ahead and shoot me. I know you have won.' Upon second thought, Lieutenant Campbell realized that this was not a game in which he was engaged. It was war. These men had photographs of our positions within their cameras, which might be the death of hundreds of our boys. They had done their best to kill him, and he had endured their bullets in order to obtain just this opportunity. And the pilot was still continuing his effort to outwit the American and get him beneath his guns. With his next maneuver, Campbell began firing. With almost his first burst, he saw that he had won. The machine of the enemy suddenly descended very rapidly. The next second it began falling out of control, and a few minutes later Lieutenant Campbell saw its last crash in our lines, a few hundred yards north of the little village of Mene le tour Campbell returned to the field and immediately jumped into a car and drove over to the scene of the crash. Here he quickly found the mangled rumpler, and in the midst of the debris were the bodies of the two late occupants with whom he had had such a prolonged duel. Both had been killed by the fall. 
the brave observer whose demeanor had so aroused Campbell's admiration was in truth a Prussian lieutenant. The pilot held the same rank. Both were subsequently given a military funeral, and their personal effects were sent back to Germany in their names. Lieutenant Campbell detached from the conquered rumpler the black crosses which decorated its wings and brought them home with him as first evidence of his well-won victory. As the machine crashed within our lines, it required but a few more hours in which to have Lieutenant Campbell's victory officially confirmed. It was his fifth. He had been the first American pilot to win five official confirmations. Douglas Campbell that night received the heartiest congratulations from all the boys in the squadron as the first American ace. The news was telegraphed to the whole world, and for a month the congratulations of the world came pouring in upon him. Almost self-taught and equipped with not the safest machine at the front, Douglas Campbell had within six weeks of his first flight over the lines fought five successful duels with the boasted air fighters of the Germans. During the early hours of the same day on which Campbell was bringing this distinguished honor to the 94th Squadron, an episode occurred which illustrates the great aid that airplanes give to the land forces in warfare. Sadly enough, this illustration is negative rather than affirmative, for it shows the misfortune that resulted from the failure of our troops always to use our airplanes before a contemplated advance. Northwest of Chypres, a small offensive movement had been planned by the American infantry. By some means or other, the enemy had received advanced information of this attack and had prepared a trap for them. According to the pre-arrangements, our artillery began the show with a terrific bombardment of shells along the German trenches. Something like 20,000 shells were poured into a small area of ground inside of one hour. Then the doughboys got the word and went over the top. They raced along across no man's land, dropped into the first line of trenches of the Germans, crawled out of them and went on to the second. All the way on to the third line of trenches of the Germans they continued their victorious course. When they arrived there they counted up their prisoners and found the whole bag consisted of but one sick Heine, whom the Germans had been unable to remove. While they were scratching their heads over this extraordinary puzzle, German gas shells began to drop among them. The enemy had calculated to an inch the exact positions they had just evacuated, and they quickly filled the trench lines with deadly fumes. Over three hundred of our boys were gassed more or less seriously before they had time to meet the devilish menace. Then they realized they had wasted their ammunition upon vacant trenches and had blindly walked into a carefully prepared trap. One single preliminary aeroplane flight over this area before beginning the offensive would have disclosed to our troops the whole situation. In fact, I believe this function of seeing for the army is the most important one that belongs to the aviation arm in warfare. Bombing, patrolling, and bringing down enemy airplanes are but trivial compared to the vast importance of knowing the exact positions of the enemy's forces and looking before you leap. On the morning of June 1st, I had an interesting little fracas with an enemy two-seater rumpler some distance within the German lines. But this pair of Bosch airmen was evidently not related to the team that Doug met on the day before. They died for the ground and continued their course homeward regardless of my earnest invitations to come back and fight it out. Much disappointed with a fruitless day's work, I went home and arranged to take a little joyride by automobile over to Nancy, the principal city in this part of France. Nancy is a city of 30,000 or thereabouts, and is called by Frenchmen the Little Paris of the East. After four years of war, its shops are now almost empty, and its glory considerably dimmed. But a visit and walk about the city's streets did all of us good after so many weeks standing on the alert. We heard rumors that the American aeroplane squadrons were to be moved soon to another sector of the front to meet a big push on Paris that was anticipated. Rumors were rife in Nancy on every topic, however, so we were not fully convinced by them. Nancy is darkened by night, as is every city or village so near the front where bombing raiders may be expected. Nothing daunted by this possibility of a raid, however, we investigated the chances for a good meal as dinner time approached. Imagine our gratification when we stepped into a restaurant on Stanislaw Plaza and found a list of good old American dishes on the menu. Upon inquiry, we found that the place was called Walter's and was quite the most pretentious café in Nancy. I called for the proprietor and learned that his name was Walter. He had formerly been chef of the Knickerbocker in New York. Visiting his old home in France, Walter had been caught by the war, joined the infantry, and after a few months at the front was wounded and retired from service. Being a native and lover of France, he decided to stay and see the war out. Accordingly, he selected Little Paris in the East and opened up a first-class restaurant, which has now become the favorite rendezvous for the many American officers who find their headquarters in this vicinity. Chapter 14. Rumpler Number 16. 
Lieutenant Smith went out with me again on June 4th, 1918. He had now become a valuable companion, and I placed the utmost dependence upon his reliability and good judgment. We crossed the lines near pont a mousson to take a look into the enemy territory and see if any inquisitive aeroplane might be coming over for photographs. Within a dozen minutes after passing the trenches, I picked up the distant silhouette of two enemy machines approaching us from the direction of Metz. I saw at first glance that these fellows had more than a thousand feet advantage of us in the matter of altitude. Without waiting to discover whether or not they had any friends behind them, I turned sharply about and began climbing for a greater height. We could neither attack the enemy nor defend ourselves advantageously so far below them. While flying south and climbing steeply, I noticed ahead of us, in the direction of our own aerodrome, an enormous number of white shell bursts dotting the heavens at about our altitude. These were American anti-aircraft shells, and they told me clearly that an enemy airplane was operating over Toul. Likewise, they indicated that no American planes were in the sky there, else our gunners would be more cautious in firing. Up to this time I had downed five German aeroplanes, every one of them behind their own lines. Confirmation from my last victory, won on May 30th, had not yet come in, so officially I was not yet an ace. That was of little consequence, but the matter of dropping a Bosch plane within our own territory where I might land beside him and have the satisfaction of seeing what sort of prize I had bagged, this was a pleasure that I rather ardently desired. Consequently, I forgot all about the late object of our attack, who presumably was still coasting along five or six miles behind us. I wigwagged my wings to attract Smith's attention, pointed the nose of my Newport towards the city of Toul, and forged with all possible speed ahead in that direction. Smith understood and followed close behind me. As we drew nearer, we easily distinguished the outline of a two-seater Hun photographing machine tranquilly pursuing its way amidst the angry burst of shrapnel. I wouldn't have taken a million dollars for my opportunity at that moment. The enemy was in our very front lawn and would drop within a few kilometers of my own hangar. He hadn't even noticed my approach, but was lazily circling about, no doubt photographing everything of interest, in the vicinity with calm indifference, to the frantic efforts of our Archie batteries. It was a rumpler, just as I had thought. I had him in a tight position. He couldn't see me as I was exactly in the middle of the sun. I had just the right amount of elevation for a leisurely direct attack. Smith stayed above me as I pushed down my joystick and began my slide. Painted in big black letters on the side of his fuselage was the number 16. The outlines of 16 was beautifully shaded from black into orange color. Just ahead of the 16 were the ornate insignia, also in orange, which represented a rising sun. I pictured the spot on the wall over my sleeping cot where those insignia would hang this evening after dinner as I directed the sights of my machine gun past the rising sun, past the observer's seat, raised them a trifle, and finally settled them dead into the pilot's seat only a hundred yards ahead of me. Absolutely certain of my aim, I pressed the trigger. Words could not describe my chagrin and rage as I realized that my gun had jammed after the first two or three shots. I dashed on by my easy target at the rate of two hundred miles per hour, cursing madly at my gun, my ammunition, and at the armorer at the aerodrome who had been careless in selecting and fitting my cartridges. The two or three bullets that I had fired merely served to give the alarm to the Huns in the machine. They would turn at once for home, while I withdrew to repair my miserable firearms. It was too true. Already they were headed for Germany and were moving away at top speed. I directed my swifter climbing machine upon a parallel course that would soon distance them as well as regain me my former superior height. And as we flew along I disengaged the faulty cartridge from the chamber of the vicars and fired a few rounds to see that the mechanism was in good firing order. All again arranged to my satisfaction, I looked below to see how far my craft had carried me. I had crossed over the lines. There lay Teocor below me, not more than a mile away. The enemy machine had been steadily diving for home all this time, and I had a very few seconds left me for an attack of any kind. All hopes of getting a victory inside my own lines had now disappeared. I should be lucky if I got confirmation for a victory at all, since we are now so far inside Germany and so near to the ground. I dived on to the attack. Most of one's troubles in this world come from something wrong inside oneself. If I hadn't been so stupidly optimistic at the outset of this engagement, I should have been more cautious, and my first disappointment would not have made me forget to keep an eye out for other enemy machines. Even Smith I had forgotten, in my rage at losing the best chance for a brilliant shot that had ever come my way. I had been flying for five minutes with almost no thoughts except angry disappointment. Now I had a rude awakening. Even as I began my last dive upon the rumpler, I heard, saw, and felt living streaks of fire pass my head. They crackled and sparkled around me like a dozen popcorn roasters, except 
that they had a far more consistent and regular rhythm. I saw a number of these tracer bullets go streaming past my face before I realized what a blessed idiot I had been. Almost scared out of my wits with the dreadful situation in which I now found myself, I did not even stop to look around and count the number of enemy machines on my tail. I imagined there were at least a thousand from the streaks of fire which their tracer bullets and incendiary ammunition cut through my wings. I kicked my rudder with my right foot and shoved my joystick to the right with a single spasmodic jerk. My machine fell over its wings and slid sideways for a few hundred feet, and then, seeing a clear country between me and dear old France, I pulled her into line and fed in the gas. The suddenness of my maneuver must have caught the Heinies quite by surprise, for as I strained out I looked behind me and saw the two fighting single-seaters, which had been on my tail, still on their downward dive. I had gotten away so quickly they did not even yet know I had gone. Number 16 and the orange-colored rising sun that I fancied would be decorating the walls over my sleeping cot were still leering at me from the fat sides of the rumpler as it descended leisurely to the ground. As I took my melancholy yet grateful way homeward, I reviewed and checked up the events of the morning. I resolved then and there never again to permit premature elation or circumstances of any kind, good or bad, to rile my temper and affect me as they had this morning. Fate had been extraordinarily good to me, and I had escaped miraculously with only a few bullet holes through my wings, but I could never expect to be so fortunate again. It was with a chastened spirit that I confronted our armorer a few minutes later and told him about my jam. Instead of bringing a severe punishment to the careless mechanics who had tested my gun and ammunition, I mildly suggested that they make a more stringent examination of my cartridges hereafter. At this time I was second in command of Squadron 94, and, as one of the privileges of the office, I could go off on voluntary patrols at any time I desired, so long as such proceedings did not interfere with my required duties. I naturally preferred going by myself, for I felt no responsibility for other pilots under such circumstances, and I had a much better chance of stealing up close to enemy airplanes without discovery. In formation flying, the whole flight is limited to the speed and altitude of its weakest member. Formation flying is very valuable to an inexperienced pilot, but after one has learned to take care of oneself, one prefers to go out with a roving commission. The morning following my disappointing encounter with number 16 of the Rising Sun Squadron, I went over to my hangar at an early hour to see that all was right with my machine. Inside the shed, I found the mechanics busy with my new pour. The gun had been dismounted and was still in the repair shop. Some defect had been discovered in the mechanism, they told me, and it had been necessary to take it to the gun repair shops for examination. My machine was out of commission for that day. Looking over the available machines, I found that Lieutenant Smith's Newport was in good condition, although the guns were not correctly aligned, according to Smith's judgment. He readily consented to my using it for a little patrol, though this necessitated his remaining behind. I knew nothing of the capabilities of his machine, yet I was pleased to try the efficacy of his twin gun mounting. My own Newport carried but one gun. Flying high over Nancy and Toul and Commercy, I tried first to learn the topmost ceiling of Smith's machine. The highest altitude, it should be explained, to which any machine can climb, is controlled by the steadily increasing rarity of the atmosphere. The higher one rises, the greater speed is required to enable the thinner air to sustain the weight of the aeroplane. Consequently, the limit of altitude for any given machine depends upon two factors, its horsepower and its weight. In order to climb an extra thousand feet, you must appreciably increase the horsepower or diminish the weight. To resume, I reached 20,000 feet and found that Smith's machine would go no higher. I fired a few bursts from each gun and found that they operated smoothly. Everything appeared to be all right. I headed for Germany and began to scour the hostile skies. For a time nothing appeared. Then, again coming from the direction of Metz, I observed a photographing two-seater accompanied by two scouts acting as protectors. Acting upon the same tactics that had appealed to me yesterday, I turned back into the sun and awaited their passing over our lines. To my delight, I saw the two fighting machines escort the rumpler fairly across our lines, and then themselves turn back into Germany. They had not seen me, and evidently considered their protection no longer necessary. I hugged the sun closely, and let the rumpler sail by below me. Imagine my extravagant joy when I again made out the painting rising sun in orange colors along the side of the rumpler's fuselage, and the big black numerals 16 following it. My escaped prize of yesterday was again within my clutches. It would never escape again. The barren walls of my sleeping quarters again rose before my eyes. Manfully I choked down all unwanted feelings of optimism, as I thought of yesterday's mishaps. But I still felt every confidence in the outcome of today's encounter. This was too good to be true. Compelling myself to patience, I followed my enemy along as he made his way still further to the south. He had some special mission to perform. Of this I was sure. I wanted to know just what this mission was. 
At the same time, the farther back he ventured, the better would be my chances for dropping him within our own territory. He was now almost over commercy. My sole fear was that some careless move of mine would disclose me to the attention of the observer. As he left commercy behind him and approached, I made up my mind to delay no longer. I suddenly left my position in the sun and darted out to the rear to intercept his retreat. It was to be a straightforward battle in the open. Let the best man win. Again my luck was with me, for I reached a point directly behind him, and had turned towards him for my first shot before they were aware of my presence. I had decided upon my tactics. Diving upon him from a diagonal direction, my first burst would doubtless cause him to put his machine into a vrie. I would anticipate this and zoom up over him and catch him dead under my next diving attack. As I neared the rumpler's tail from three-quarters direction, I saw the observer suddenly straighten himself up and look around at me. He had been down in the bottom of his office, probably taking photographs of the scenery below. The pilot had seen my machine in his mirror and had just given the warning to the rear gunner. As he faced me, I began firing. Two unexpected things happened immediately. Instead of falling into a vrie, as any intelligent German would certainly have done, this pilot zoomed sharply up and let me go under him. In fact, I had about the thousandth part of a second in which to decide to go under rather than ram the monster. Thus my clever plans were all upset by the refusal of my antagonist to do the maneuver that I had assigned to him. Our positions were reversed. Instead of my being on top and firing at him, he was on top and by some extraordinary miracle he was firing at me. I circled away and looked back to unravel this mystery. I quickly solved it. From out of the belly of the rumpler a wicked-looking machine gun was pumping tracer bullets at me as fast as any gun ever fired. It was a new and hitherto unheard of method of defense, this shooting through the floor. No wonder he had climbed instead of trying to escape. To add to my discomfiture, I jammed both my guns on my next attack. There appeared to be no justice in the world. I circled away out of range and moodily cleared the jam in one of my guns. The other absolutely refused to operate further. In the meantime, I had not failed to keep an occasional eye upon the movements of my adversary, and another swift glance at intervals to see that no other enemy machines were coming to interrupt the little duel that was to ensue. I sobered up completely and considered the exact chances of getting in one swift death blow with my more adroit Newport before the more heavily armed Rumpler could bring its armament to bear upon me. The enemy machine was flying homewards now, straight in the direction of Saint Mihiel. Coming at him again from below, I got in two or three good bursts that should have made an impression upon him, but didn't. The lower berth I found altogether too hot a position to hold, owing to the floor guns of the enemy. So I zoomed suddenly up overhead and circled back to try to catch the observer unprepared to receive me. Several times I tried this dodge, but I found one of the most agile acrobats in the German army on duty in that back seat. He would be lying face downwards in the tail of his machine one second, firing at me. I would zoom up and come alongside and over him within two seconds, yet I always found him standing on his feet and ready for me. We exchanged burst after burst, that observer and I, and soon came to know all about each other's idiosyncrasies. I do not know what he thinks of me, but I am willing to acknowledge him the nimblest airman I ever saw. We had been at this game for forty minutes, and the Rumpler pilot had not fired a shot. I had long ago given up hope of their ever exhausting their ammunition. They must have had a week's supply for the rear guns alone. And now we were well back of the German lines again. I continued to circle and fire a short burst of a half a dozen shots, but found it impossible to break through their defensive tactics long enough to get a steady true aim upon any vital part of their machine. We were getting lower and lower. They were preparing to land. I fired a farewell burst, and in the middle of it my gun again jammed. The pilot waved his hand goodbye to me. The observer fired a last cheery burst from his Tyrrell guns, and the show was over for the day. My coveted sixteen would not decorate my bedroom walls this night. I flew thoughtfully homewards, wondering at the curious coincidence that had brought number sixteen and myself together for two days running, and the strange fate that seemed to protect it. It was unbelievable that a heavy two-seater could escape a fighting machine with all the circumstances in favor of the latter. It must have been something wrong with me, I concluded. Just then my motor gave an expiring chug, and I began to drop. I leveled out as flat as possible and looked ahead. I should be able to glide across the trenches from here if Smith's machine was any good at all. So fed up with disappointment was I that I did not much care whether I reached the American lines or not. What could have happened to the full motor anyway? glanced at my wrist watch and found the answer. I had been so absorbed in my pursuit of number 16 that I had forgotten all about the passing of time. It had been two hours and thirty-five minutes since I had left the ground, and the Newport was supposed to carry oil but for two and a quarter hours flight. The oil completely exhausted, my motor was frozen stiff, and a forced landing in some nearby shell hole was an imminent certainty. 
the continued favors of providence in keeping enemy planes away from me in that homeward glide served to restore my faith in justice i crossed the lines and even made the vicinity of Mini la tour before it became necessary to look for a smooth landing ground there was little choice and what choice there was appeared to be worse than the others barbed wire stretched across every field in close formation selecting the most favorable spaces i settled down just cleared the top of the wire with my wheels and settled without crashing into a narrow field as i climbed out of my machine several doughboys came running up and inquired as to whether i was wounded a few minutes later major miller drove up the road in a touring car having seen my forced landing from a nearby town i left a guard in charge of the stranded aeroplane and drove away with the major to telephone to my aerodrome for the aeroplane ambulance and to report that i had landed without injury as it proved impossible to get through by telephone the major very kindly offered to drive me home in his car in half an hour i was back with my squadron none the worse for the day's adventures but on the other hand none the better save for a little more of that eternal fund of experience which seemed to be forever waiting for me over the enemy's lines but as soon as i stepped out of the car i learned of an occurrence which dispelled all thoughts of my own adventures douglas campbell had just landed and was dangerously wounded chapter fifteen campbell's last fight shortly after i had left the aerodrome that morning for my second rendezvous with my bete noire number sixteen jimmy meisner and doug campbell had followed me on a little expedition of their own they had chosen the vicinity to the east of pont a mousson doug and jimmy were two of the best pals in the world indeed it would be a very difficult matter for anybody to be in jimmy meisner's company for more than an hour without becoming his pal both these boys had companionable natures they were constantly in each other's company, Jimmy and Douglas, and very frequently they went off on these special hunting parties together. On this occasion it appears that after a short tour together back of the lines they became separated. Jimmy went off on a wild goose chase of his own, leaving Lieutenant Campbell reconnoitering back and forth over the same locality to the east of pont mousson Upon one of his patient tacks, Campbell discovered a rumpler coming from Germany and evidently aiming towards the vicinity of Nancy he hid himself in the sun and awaited its approach the encounter took place at about the same time i was fighting my number sixteen some twenty miles to the west of them douglas began his battle with everything in his favor he caught the bosch completely by surprise and put enough bullets into the enemy craft to sink an ordinary bus but the hun wouldn't drop he simply sailed along and continued to pot doug's newport every time he swung in for an attack they had very much the same sort of running fight as I was having with my antagonist, number 16. Finally, Meisner saw something going on over the Nancy sky and came speeding back in to take a hand in the combat. Just as Jimmy drew near to the scene of the scrap, he saw that he was diverting some of the pilot's attention to himself. Campbell saw this too and immediately took advantage of the opportunity. Coming diagonally in towards the observer from behind, Doug suddenly changed his course and swerved around to the front for shot at the preoccupied pilot. He got in a fairly long burst before he was compelled to turn aside to avoid a collision. Though he had not touched the pilot, he had the good fortune to shower the motor with bullets, and to his great joy he saw that the machine was really out of control. The pilot, unable to maintain headway and maneuver at the same time, had to put down his nose and was gliding northwards for his lines. At this juncture, Jimmy took a hand in the scrap, and both pilot and observer had their hands full to prevent a surprise attack from one of the two circling Newport. But the American's time was short. The lines were but half a dozen miles away. With his present height, the German pilot could glide his machine well behind his own lines. The coup de grace must be delivered at once, if the Americans were to prevent the morning's photographs from falling into the hands of the enemy. There was no way of communicating a plan of simultaneous attack between the two Newport, but both pilots had the same intention and watched each other jockeying around the rumpler until a favorable opening presented itself. Suddenly both Meisner and Campbell came in upon the enemy from opposite sides. Campbell got a faster start and, braving the fire from the observer, died below for a hundred feet, only to zoom suddenly upwards and direct another long burst through the floor of the rumpler. Swerving then off to the right, he again came by the side of the observer. The latter, unfortunately, had changed his position to fire at Meisner after Campbell had darted below him on the other side. As Doug now reappeared from below the rumpler, he came full into range of the observer's guns. Doug was just coming out of his zoom and beginning a flat circle to the front when a loud explosion at the small of his back told him that he had been hit. He felt a burning pain run up the length of his spine. 
he was still some two miles above Mother Earth, and his first thought was to retain his senses until he could bring his machine safely to ground. He immediately flew for home, leaving the outcome of the battle to his comrade. Meisner saw Campbell draw away and immediately jumped to the conclusion that he had been wounded. He had not seen the bullet strike him, however, and there was always the chance that merely an engine failure had compelled Doug to withdraw. No matter what was the cause, Jimmy's duty was to prevent the safe return of the enemy machine to its own lines. He could be of no help to his companion anyway. He continued his harassing of the pilot, and so occupied that gentleman with maneuvers that by the time the trenches were reached, Jimmy had the satisfaction of seeing that the rumpler could not possibly get to a safe zone for landing. Just a few hundred yards beyond the first German line trench, the rumpler crashed. Both the pilot and observer scrambled from their seats and ran for their lives. Our doughboys gave them a shower of bullets which greatly accelerated their speed. The Bosch soldiers in their trenches stood up and leveled a machine gun fire at our men to protect their aviator's foot race for safety. The next moment the American artillery directed a heavy shell fire of high explosive against the abandoned rumpler. These were better marksmen than the last I mentioned. After half a dozen shots nothing but fragments remained. All this spectacle Jimmy gleefully observed before he turned his machine homewards and hastened to find out what had happened to Douglas Campbell. He reached the aerodrome just about the same time I did. Doug was safely landed, and he had climbed out of the machine without assistance. Although suffering much pain, he would not leave the field until he had learned just how he had been hit. A short inspection disclosed the whole story. An explosive bullet fired by the observer had come through the floor of Campbell's machine just at the instant he was making a turn. It had penetrated the bottom of the fuselage, gone through the bottom of his seat, and then it struck a wire which had exploded the missile not three inches from Campbell's back. The fragments had scattered backwards and to the side, riddling the framework and fabric which covered the fuselage behind the seat. Very few of the fragments had gone forward. This miraculous circumstance had undoubtedly saved Doug's life. Jimmy and I gazed with stupefaction at the smiling and imperturbable Doug. He stood beside us, refusing all aid, and appeared more deeply interested in the condition of his machine than in his own wounds. In the back of his teddy bear suit, a long, jagged tear showed us where the missile had entered his body. Frightful bloodstains covered his back, yet he was deaf to all our entreaties, and refused to let us lead him away. I asked what had been done about getting an ambulance down, and found that Campbell had sent for a motorcycle. I could not help laughing at this childish desire to avoid making a scene which I very well knew had actuated Doug's request for a motorcycle. I immediately commandeered an automobile, and, putting Doug carefully in it, several of us accompanied him to the hospital. With continued fortitude, Doug refused an anesthetic while the surgeon was removing the bullet. It was found that the steel nose itself had been deflected by the wire into Doug's back. By some miracle, it had not touched his spinal column, but had traveled up alongside it for five or six inches, and finally buried itself in the muscle under the shoulder. This little memento Doug now preserves as his most cherished souvenir of the Great War. With splendid grit, Doug smiled and talked while the doctor proceeded with the operation. He drew all the details of the finish of the rumpler from Jimmy, and learned with great satisfaction that this was his sixth official victory. In reality, Douglas Campbell's victories total seven, but for one which was down to my certain knowledge, he never received official confirmation. Had it not been for this unfortunate accident, Lieutenant Douglas Campbell would undoubtedly have one of the highest scores of victories claimed by any air fighter, for he was just entering upon his full stride. As it was, he never fought again. Upon his return in November from America, where he was sent to recover his strength after leaving the hospital, Doug rejoined his old squadron, only to find that its days of fighting were over. The subject of my encounter with Rising Sun No. 16 occasioned no end of amusement about the mess, and many bets were laid as to the outcome. I dreamed about number 16 at night, and was up bright and early on the lookout for him every morning. I took a few of the bets myself, naturally enough. I never in my life wanted anything so much as those orange-colored insignia as decorations for my quarters. I planned to build a house some day suitably designed to set off those works of art to the best advantage. The fates were surely laughing at me all this time. My further adventures with number 16 would have appeared comic to me if they had not been so infuriating. The very next day I went up again in my own machine with just the one resolve burning in my brain. I saw nothing else in the sky and searched for nothing else. In fact, I had scarcely gained my very topmost altitude 
and set forth in the direction of what I now knew was the favorite path of this daily visitor, before I saw him coming to meet me. It was almost as though we had met by appointment. As I have said, I reached my very highest altitude before going forth to this tryst. Some new poor have a higher ceiling than others. It depends upon the quality and natural fitness of the motor. My bus reached 18,000 feet that morning. It had just been fitted with two Vickers guns instead of the one it formerly carried. This additional weight of 30 or 40 pounds hampered the climb somewhat and lowered my ceiling by at least 500 feet. Try as I would, I could get her no higher. As we approached each other, number 16 and I, the rumpler was at 20,000 feet and was still climbing. My Bosch friends knew perfectly well they could climb higher than any Newport. It might make their photographs a little indistinct, but even those were better than our own taken from 12,000 feet. They came steadily on, and I turned as they passed me, and continued a parallel course some 2,000 feet below them. The railroad stations at Nancy and Toul were their objectives this morning. Without deigning to pay any attention to me, they proceeded over their course and deliberately snapped their pictures. Occasionally the observer amused himself with a little target practice at me. At such times I realized that he had nothing else to do, so concluded obviously that he did not desire photographs of those parts of his voyage. I too fired vain long bursts upwards. I had no idea of hitting them at that long range. It merely served to keep them informed that I was still in their company. They knew that they had me at their mercy as far as giving me a chance at a combat. So we continued all along over the northeast of France. I suppose most of the films they developed that afternoon showed the wings of my Newport below them. My one chance was to keep below them and follow them until they came down. As there is no record of any German machine not coming down finally, I determined to follow the Bosch back to Berlin if necessary, in order to get a shot at them when they passed my level. Thus we crossed the lines and proceeded steadily northwards. I could outfly the Rumpler and outdive him, but his superior engine power and greater wing spread gave him a much higher ceiling. After seeing mile after mile slip away beneath my wings, and still no evidence of change of heart in my antagonists, I began to speculate upon the quantity of gasoline the rumpler carried. I knew too well the limits of the Newport's fuel supply, and the disadvantage again lay with me. For if we both became exhausted at the same time, the rumpler would be in his own territory, while I would be many hostile miles from my own. With savage realization that I was again defeated, I turned around and took my way homewards. I can imagine my two Bosch adversaries laughing at me as I gave up the chase. They began to glide downwards as soon as I had turned my back. I sheared back at them just to have the satisfaction of showing them I was still their master. Very obediently they altered their tactics and again climbed for their superior ceiling. When I reached camp I scoured the hangars for information of the highest climbing machine on the aerodrome. My comrades followed me about, supplying me with much gratuitous information and advice. They advised me to leave off both guns next day, which might permit me to reach 20,000 feet. Or, if I took no fuel along, I might go up to 30,000 feet. Uncomplimentary references to the weight of my shoes and the heaviness of my grouch aided me considerably. The result of my researches indicated that Captain Marr's machine had the best reputation for climbing, and I immediately set off to obtain his consent for the loan of his Newport on the morrow. He readily consented to let me have it, adding that he knew I could reach 22,000 feet with it if I coaxed it properly. I assured him I would coax it all right, and left to make my preparations. The ideal fighting machine is, of course, one that will outperform every enemy machine in every variety of movement. And there are several kinds of performances that are almost equally valuable in combat fighting. A swift speed is essential, a rapid climb, the ability to dive directly down without overstraining the structure, or ripping off the fabric by too sudden an alteration of direction, a high ceiling, which necessitates high engine power and perfect carburation, quick maneuverability, all these characteristics, if combined, would make an ideal fighting machine. This naturally is just what the fighting nations were striving to obtain. Each machine had a superiority in some particular, but failed in another. The famous German Fokker held the skies in 1916 and 1917 for it combined more of these essential details than did any one fighting craft of the Allies. Then came the Spad, which the French designed to outspeed and outmaneuver the Fokker, but still the Fokker had a higher ceiling and a swifter dive. The British produced the SE-5 in 1918, which outdove and outmaneuvered the Fokker, but could not overtake it on a flat race, nor outclimb it. 
The Sopwith Camel likewise came from England and proved superior to the best German fighting machines, except in the matter of diving and high ceiling. As for the Americans, we had to take what machines the Allied nations could spare us. Naturally, they kept the best for themselves, and our squadrons of American pilots did the best they could with the second best. It was at this time that we heard rumors of a new English fighting machine called the Snipe. Like the Camel, it was a Sopwith production. A new engine that was shrouded in much secrecy and mystery was reputed to have carried this little scout machine to the incredible altitude of 33,000 feet, and the speed with which it made this climb broke all the world's records. Our boys of 94 Squadron were naturally desirous of providing themselves with a quantity of these wonderful machines, and then trying a few combats with the Richthofen Circus Fockers. For the present, however, we had to take what was given to us. We felt that we were not fulfilling the expectations of the people back home, who had been told that we had 20,000 of the best airplanes in the world, and all made in America. The truth is that not one American-made fighting machine came to the front until the war was ended. Considerably discouraged over the prospects of securing my bedroom trophies from Rising Sun No. 16, I nevertheless climbed into Captain Marr's machine the next morning at exactly 8.15, and amid the cheers of the boys who gathered to see me off, I bade the mechanics to pull away the chocks. I made a direct path to our rendezvous of yesterday, climbing as I flew northward and east. Like every enthusiastic owner, Captain Marr had given his bus all the credit that he consistently could. I had driven automobiles whose owners got a regular performance of twenty miles to the gallon of gasoline, but try as one might it would make but one half that mileage for anybody else. I put Captain Marr's Newport up to a little over nineteen thousand feet that morning, and there she hung. Every artifice that ever moved an engine was experimented in, but without increasing her capacities an inch. Just as I had satisfied myself that I had exhausted her possibilities, I discovered my old friend, number 16, winging his way calmly towards me. He was certainly prompt and businesslike in the way he kept his appointments. Just as yesterday, the rumpler was some two thousand feet above my highest possible elevation. With rare magnanimity, my old friends kindly came down a few hundred feet to keep me company. I joined in the procession as of yore, and the two machines made another grand tour of the northeasterly cities of France, where we photographed all the railroad lines and canals, took a turn over several aerodromes, French, British, and American, surveyed the charming landscape in all directions, and finally decided to call it a day and go home. My presence served to prevent our batteries from firing noisy shells at my friends, and they must have appreciated this act of courtesy on my part for during the whole morning's promenade they did not fire a single shot at me from the machine-gun which I could plainly see protruding out of the belly of the monster overhead. I accompanied them back to their aerodrome, sedulously maintaining the proper distance between us. Seeing they wanted to alight, and mindful of their most delightful courtesy to me throughout the day, I turned about and made for home. That night I came down with the fever, and was immediately sent to Paris on leave. Chapter 16 Becoming an Ace Paris in wartime is well enough known to millions of my fellow countrymen, but the scene that presented itself to my astonished eyes as I alighted at the Gare de l'Est on the morning of June 6, 1918, merits a description. That date, it will be remembered, marked probably the lowest ebb in the spirits of the Parisian populace. The Germans were along the Marne, and but thirty miles from the capital. Chateau Thierry was in their hands. The villagers in that vicinity, who had braved four years of adjacent warfare, were now swept away from their homes. Thousands of these poor refugees were arriving in Paris on the morning I entered it. Used as I was to the various horrors of war, there was a terror in the countenances of these homeless people that made a new impression upon me. Old women, young women, all clothed in wretched garments and disheveled headgear, wandered blindly through the streets adjoining the stations, with swarms of crying children clinging to their skirts. Pathetic as this scene was, it had its comic features in the extraordinary articles that these fleeing peasants had chosen to carry with them. Umbrellas seemed to be the most precious thing that they had tried to save. A little bundle, probably containing a loaf of bread and a few articles of clothing, was carried by each woman. The children were loaded down with such strange treasures as axes, parrot cages, wooden buckets, and farm implements. The few old men who accompanied them hobbled along empty-handed, with the utmost patience and abandon. Evidently the whole care of the migration was left to the energetic women of France. 
They had all been walking for many miles. This was very evident. Their clothing was dusty, worn, and crumpled. Their faces were pinched and wretched, and an indescribable look of misery and suffering filled every face. The pathos of this scene will never leave my memory. And here I desire to express my appreciation of the magnificent work of the American Red Cross and the American YMCA organizations. In that one case of the Chateau Thierry refugees, these American societies repaid their American subscribers for the sacrifices they made to support them. Indeed, without the help of this American agency, I can easily imagine that the French capital, overwhelmed and crushed under the burden and horror of these calamities, would long since have abandoned all hope, and riots and disorders would have prostrated the authorities in control of the nation. Thousands of refugees swarmed throughout a more or less demoralized Paris. They had no money, no food, no idea of where they wanted to go. The spirit was gone from their bodies. Only the call of hunger served to remind them that they still must live. Preparations were immediately made to care for this new demand upon the American charitable organizations. It was a very critical period of the war. Every available soldier was at the front, and these must have the undivided attention of the supply officers, the commissary department, and government authorities. Refugees were of no consequence towards winning the war. They deserved pity, but could not be permitted to divert the attention of the defenders of a nation. How dangerous this subtle menace might have been will never be known, for the American Red Cross threw itself into the situation and cared for this increasing army of unfed in Paris. Had they been neglected a day or two longer, such riots might have been started in Paris as would have demoralized the whole system of the French organization. The secret of their success was undoubtedly due to the elasticity and absence of red tape in their organization. But whatever it may have been, the fact that the American Red Cross did successfully feed and clothe these bedraggled thousands was in itself a marvel, and made me appreciate how valuable an asset our Red Cross Society was and is in wartime. At the aerodromes and at other military camps all along the front, I had abundant opportunities to appreciate this unofficial, or rather unmilitary, aid that was given to the soldiers by these organizations. At our group aerodrome, the Red Cross later established a small club room for the pilots and officers. Here hot chocolate and toast was served in the afternoon, and a cheery fire was always found to tempt us out of the mud and rain for a few minutes of recreation. Car tables and writing tables were there, and a piano and phonograph, together with all the old magazines that were sent over by American readers, whiled away many a dud afternoon, which must have otherwise been spent in more or less solitary confinement within a dripping billet. The YMCA authorities provided in a similar way for the enlisted men. Candy, tobacco, and toilet articles were provided at these places at a lower figure than they would have cost at home. Most of these things were absolutely unattainable at the stores in France. After a good night's sleep, far away from the customary roar of artillery, I woke up to find the sun shining in my Paris window and a fine day well progressed. After breakfast, I took a stroll along the Champs-Élysées under the Arc de Triomphe and through the beautiful walks of the Bois de Boulogne. It was easy to read upon the faces of the people one met the deadly fear that gripped them. Thousands had already fled from Paris. The authorities were even at that morning considering again moving the seat of government to more distant Bordeaux. The capture of Paris before the American aid could arrive was a possibility that worried every Parisian. I tried to fancy the exulting German officers walking down these same beautiful avenues, driving their motor cars through these splendid woods, and occupying such of these magnificent palaces as happened to tempt their cupidity. Then I thought of the spirit of the Marne, which had so strengthened the French people in those cruel days of 1914. Studying the set faces of the passers-by, I could discover that the same indomitable spirit still held them. Their faces held something of the same expression that was pictured on that famous French Liberty Loan poster, a poilu standing with fixed bayonet defending his native land. Underneath the poster was written that immortal phrase, Il ne passe pas! After a few days in Paris, I returned to my aerodrome by way of army headquarters, then situated in Chaumont, just south of Toul. Good news awaited me at my mess. I learned that General Foulois had been out to see us, and after hearing the repeated stories of the narrow escapes we had had with the fragile Newport, he had promised to secure spot aeroplanes for our whole squadron. They were to be driven with a 220-horsepower hispano Suiza motor, and would serve to equip us second to none of the squadrons in France. Furthermore, 
confirmations had been secured, for my fifth victory and several cablegrams from America were handed me, congratulating me on becoming the second American ace. The news had reached the States before it had found me in Paris. We had had another victory, too. Jimmy Meisner, Alan Winslow, and Thorne Taylor had encountered a Hanover two-seater on June 13th, and after a ten-minute combat had the satisfaction of seeing the enemy go down in flames and crash just north of Teocor. The boys were very much elated over the additional news of our contemplated removal to a busier sector of the front. Hunting had become very poor along our old sector. The enemy machines were infrequently met, and almost no fighting machines of the Germans were now opposing us. An occasional observing machine came our way, and he usually fled long before we had an opportunity for an attack. We had been for two months on this sector, and had received all the preliminary practice fighting that we desired. All the boys were restless, and were anxious to get to the thick of the battle down on the Marne, where the big push was now taking place. Fresh from the rumors of Paris, I naturally inflamed their appetite for the contest by picturing to them the state of affairs as I had seen it in the capital. We all felt that we could intercept the Hun invasion and save Paris, if we but had the chance. At this period, we began to notice that the German air tactics seemed to pin all hopes for success upon formation flying. Larger and still larger numbers of enemy airplanes clung together when they ventured into hostile skies. From flights of three to five machines in one formation, their offensive patrols now included whole squadrons of twenty or more machines in one group. Certain advantages undoubtedly accrue to such formations. Mere numbers serve to scare away the more cautious air fighters, and even the most daring find themselves confronted with such a bewildering and formidable number of antagonists that to attack one must necessarily include defending oneself against several. The Germans were limited in the territory they covered by thus combining their aeroplane strength, but while directing their attack upon one especial sector, such as the Chateau Thierry sector, they could operate very successfully with these large formations, and were able to sweep away all opposition from their paths. Squadron 94 therefore began to sedulously practice flying in similar large formations. Day after day we called together all of our available machines, and took the sky together, met at a designated altitude, and forming a compact group we circled about, executed the various maneuvers that must attend an offensive or defensive movement, and strove always to keep all our airplanes in such a position that no single one could ever be cut out and subjected to an attack by an enemy formation. This was a valuable lesson to all of us, and later on we accumulated quite a respectable number of victories by reason of our familiarity with this method of squadron formation flying. Especially valuable is this formation flying to the inexperienced pilot. One illustration will serve to demonstrate my meaning. On the evening of June 18, 1918, a few days after I had returned to the command of my first flight in Squadron 94, we were notified by the British bombing squadrons that they were undertaking a raid upon the railroad yards of Thionville that evening at 7.30 o'clock. Thionville, or Dieterhofen, as it is called by the Germans, lies west of Metz and is the favorite gateway to the front from the German interior in the direction of Koblenz and Cologne. Huge supplies were kept there, and several squadrons of enemy machines were always on the alert to repel these bombing raids upon their city. Calling the boys together, I asked for volunteers to go with me on this protective mission for the British. Six pilots stepped forward, and we immediately prepared our plans. Lieutenant Hamilton Coolidge had just joined our group and had not yet made his first trip over the lines. He asked permission to accompany us, and thinking this would be a good opportunity to keep an eye upon him, I consented to his going. We were to meet the bombing machines over Thionville at 7.30 sharp, and at an altitude of 16,000 feet. We arranged to get above our field and circle at about 2,000 feet until all were ready, then form our positions and fly over in close formation. As we were getting off the field, I noticed that Squadron 95 was likewise sending up a number of machines. Later I learned that they too had heard of the bombing expedition of the British and were going over to see it safely home. Unfortunately, they had picked upon the same altitude and the same place for their rendezvous that I had selected. In ten minutes more I realized that there would be a hopeless tangle of the two formations if I persisted in collecting my followers at the prearranged rendezvous. All the machines were circling about the same position, and collisions would be inevitable if the newer pilots were permitted to maneuver about in all this confusion. I accordingly flew about in a wide circle, signaling to my pilots to draw away and follow me. Time was pressing, and we must get to pont a mousson by 7.30, even if we were not in our best formation. Two or three of the pilots understood my signals and followed after me. 
The others got into the other formation and came with it. Some of the inexperienced pilots, including Ham Coolidge, lost both formations and came on alone. Arriving over the Moselle River at pont mousson exactly on the minute, I saw in the direction of Metz a heavy archy fire. This meant that Allied machines were there and were attracting German fire. I flew in to see what it was all about and found a single Samson machine, belonging to the American No. 91 Squadron, falling in a sharp vrie. At 4,000 feet he picked himself up and regaining control of his machine he leveled off for home. I accompanied him back over the lines and saw him safely off for his aerodrome and then turned my attention again to the British bombing machines. Near San Miguel I found part of my formation following Lieutenant Loomis. Ham Coolidge had attached himself to this party. We cruised about together until dusk began to gather, and still there was no sign of the British machines. Suddenly Loomis left me and started for home with Coolidge in his wake. I decided one or both of them had experienced motor trouble, and watched them disappear with no misgivings. It was indeed time we got in, as the ground would be considerably darker at this hour than one would expect to find it, with the western sun still shining in one's eyes at 15,000 feet elevation. I dropped down over pont mousson and getting fairly into the twilight, turned my machine towards home. Arriving in the vicinity of my landing field, I was suddenly surprised to see a Newport flash past me, going in exactly the opposite direction. I didn't know who it could be, but it was now so dark that longer flying would be almost suicidal. Feeling instinctively that it might be one of the new pilots, I banked over and started in pursuit. A mile or so this side of the lines I overtook him. Swerving in closely ahead of the stranger, I wigwagged my wings and circled back. To my great relief, I saw that he understood me and was following. We soon made our way back to the tool aerodrome and landed without accident. Getting out of my machine, I went over to ascertain the identity of my companion. It was Hamilton Coolidge. After a question or two, Ham admitted that he had become confused in the darkness, had lost sight of Lieutenant Loomis, and for some reason or other became convinced that he was flying in the wrong direction. He had reversed directions, and was flying straight into the enemy's lines when I had so fortunately passed nearby and had intercepted him. Formation flying, then, has its uses in other ways than in combat fighting. We had made a confused mess of our formation on this occasion, but for a miracle it would have ended in the loss of a new pilot who later was to become one of the strongest men in 94 Squadron. One of the comic little incidents that are always rising unexpectedly out of the terrors of war came from my meeting that day with the Thompson machine from Squadron 91. I was just going to bed that night when they called me to the telephone. A member of 91 Squadron wanted to know who was in the Newport machine that had escorted him across the lines that evening from the vicinity of Metz. I told him I thought I was the man he sought. Well, he said, I am Lieutenant Hammond of the 91st, and I want to thank you for your help. I told him there had been very little to thank me for, since there was no enemy airplanes about, but I thanked him for calling me up. Then I asked him what had caused him to fall into a vrie. Those blooming Archibalds, he informed me. They've got the finest little battery over that vicinity that I've ever seen. I was coming peacefully home with all my photographs when hell suddenly busted loose below me. Their first shell exploded just under my tail, and I went up a hundred feet tail first. Then I began to fall out of control. Evidently my control wires had been severed, for I couldn't get her out of the spin for four or five thousand feet. Just as I finally strained out, along came another shell and did the same thing to me all over again. I fell again, this time feeling certain that I was a goner. You came along while I was going down the second time. I managed to get her strained out, as you know, when you and I crossed safely over the lines without any more hits. But say, Rickenbacker, he went on, do you know what I'm going to do? I've got a sharpshooter's badge that I won while I was in the light artillery. I've wrapped it up in a small package and tied a long streamer onto it. I've written a note and put it in, telling those heinies that they are more entitled to that badge than I am, and here it is. Come along and go with me tomorrow morning and we will drop it down on their battery. I laughed and told him I would be ready for him tomorrow morning over my field at eight o'clock. We would go over and brave the Archie sharpshooters once more, just for the satisfaction of carrying out a foolish joke. But the next morning I was awakened at three o'clock by an orderly who told me Major Atkinson wished to talk to me over the telephone. Even as I stood by the telephone, I could hear a tremendous barrage of artillery fire from the German lines. Something big was on. Chapter 17 A Perplexing Bank of Fog the heavy firing that was now so apparent to me had awakened Major Atkinson in his bed at headquarters, 
which was then in a building adjoining us. He had immediately called us up to order us to take a patrol over the lines at the first break of day and ascertain what this unusual demonstration could mean. I looked at my watch. It was then just five minutes past three. In another hour it would be light enough to leave the field. Running over to Lieutenant Meisner's billet, I roused him out and then went on to awaken the three or four pilots in his flight. In ten minutes all five of us were in the kitchen, stirring up the cooks to faster efforts in the heating of coffee and toast. I had already telephoned the hangars and ordered all of our machines out on the field in full readiness. At a quarter to four we were in our machines and were leaving the field. Two other pilots had joined us. It was just beginning to grow light enough to make out the tails of our machines ahead of us. I directed Lieutenant Meisner to have three of his pilots fly at an altitude of five thousand feet, and for him to take the other two pilots in his formation and fly below them at one thousand five hundred feet above ground. I myself was to keep as close above the contour of the ground as possible and see what the Germans were doing in their first and second line trenches. With all details of our mission fully understood, we set off and made directly for the north, where the heaviest shooting seemed to be going on. As we neared the lines, I could see the constant flashing of the German guns in the darkness. The greatest activity appeared to be just halfway between pont a mousson and Saint-Mahel. Here in the vicinity of Chypres, the country lies comparatively flat between the mountains, which border the Moselle on the one hand, and the Meuse on the other. I knew this locality well, and could fly at only a hundred feet from the ground, without fear of striking against some mountainside in the darkness. The Huns were doing most of the firing. This was plainly evident from the continuous flashes. The noise of the exploding shells was deadened by the roaring of my aeroplane motor. As I neared the center of all this excitement, I sheared off to the north and flew down low enough over the German trenches to permit the tornado of German shells to pass well over my head. Along this course I followed the entire length of the trenches, back and forth, back and forth, until I was convinced that there was no massed bodies of enemy troops waiting for the barrage to cease before they poured forth over the top. The more I studied the situation, the more puzzled I became. I saw the German shells bursting close behind our lines. From the nature of the bursts, I knew they were high-explosive shells. This was the usual preliminary to a sudden rush over the top, yet there were no German troops there waiting for the moment of attack. The whole vicinity of the German front was covered with a dense fog. The intermittent gun flashes showed but dimly through this mist. Off to the east and the west, where the Meuse and the Moselle rivers might be supposed to emit a fog of this sort, the landscape was clear. It was all very puzzling to me. On each of my excursions back and forth over the German trenches, I peeked down from my low level and fired long bursts into their lines with my two machine guns. I could see my flaming tracer bullets, cutting through the night and burying themselves within the enemy trenches. It was still too dark to distinguish the ground at any distance from the trenches, but I was positive that if any considerable number of men were there, they were well under cover. At last I ran out of ammunition. I decided to fly home, make a report of what I had seen, and replenish with fuel and cartridges. I telephoned my report to Major Atkinson while the mechanics were looking after my bus, and in ten minutes I was back again for the region of Chypres. By this time the first streaks of dawn were lighting up the ground. While still a great distance away, I again noticed the strange clinging bank of fog which began at the German line and covered a space about three miles east and west and half a mile deep. On the American side of the lines, the ground was entirely free from this mist. As I again approached the German trenches, I saw more activity there. I dived upon them, letting go long bursts from my guns. Instantly they disappeared from view. It was a very enjoyable game I had as long as any heads remained in view, but after one or two dashes along this front, I could find no more targets. The Huns had retired to their underground dugouts. Many a German fled in terror before my approach that morning. I found myself chuckling with delight over the consternation I single-handed was spreading throughout the German camp. Coming down immediately over the trenches, I would observe a group of soldiers standing outside a dugout, all leveling their rifles at me. With a sudden swerve, I would bring them before my sights, and long before they could all cram themselves within the opening, I would have a hundred bullets inside their group and would be beyond their reach. I could imagine the terror and helplessness my single presence inspired among the slow-moving troops below. I was having the time of my life. One particular battery of 77s lay a mile back of the lines and seemed to be having a particularly jolly party. Their flashes almost doubled the other batteries in rapidity. I determined to fly over and pay them a visit, 
since none of the infantrymen seemed to care to stick up their heads in the trenches. Accordingly, I turned a bit to the rear and came in upon the battery from behind and at about one hundred feet above ground. As I neared them, I saw six or eight three-inch guns standing side by side in a little clearing, the line of gunners all rushing swiftly to and fro, picking up and passing forward the fifteen-pound shells. The guns were firing at the rate of almost one shot each second. A continuous flash could be seen from this little battery. So rapidly did the gunners work. In a twinkling after my first shot, the whole battery became silent. Pointing my nose directly at the end of the line, I pressed my triggers and raked the whole line before straightening out my aeroplane. Then, with a quick bank, I came about and repeated the performance. Before I had started back, every man had fled for shelter, and not a gun was firing. I circled about again and again, chasing the scattered groups of gunners to their respective dugouts and firing short bursts at their heels as they fled. It was the most amusing little party I had ever attended. I couldn't help wondering what kind of reception I would get if a sudden pan dropped me within their clutches. One more dash at the next battery and my ammunition was again exhausted. I returned to the aerodrome, where I found that Lieutenant Meisner and his pilots had returned without anything new to report. At 7.30 we all reassembled for breakfast. We were still discussing the extraordinary episode of the morning, and had none of us arrived at any reasonable explanation for the enemy artillery activity, when a visitor was announced for breakfast. He came in and introduced himself as Frank Taylor, representing the United Press Association. We welcomed him heartily, and began plying him with questions as to the latest news. He told us he was out of touch with events lately himself, for he had been up all night with the American Gas Organization, who had just been experimenting with their first gas attack on the German trenches north of Chypres. Then we all shouted. The whole circus became clear as daylight to us. The attack had not been announced generally, and Major Atkinson himself was in ignorance as to its hour for demonstration. The Germans, awakened by the fumes at three o'clock this morning, had very naturally imagined that it would precede a sudden attack by our troops. Consequently, they ordered out all their available artillery to shell the advanced positions of the Americans, thinking they would destroy our masses of troops in waiting. The fact was that none of our troops were there, but were soundly sleeping in their beds until the terrible uproar of the German guns compelled them to stay awake. The whole gas attack was but an experiment by our forces, and so far as I have learned was the first time gas was used in war by our American troops. This cleared up the whole mystery for the Toul aerodrome, and we made a particularly merry breakfast over it. Personally, I would have refused a great deal in exchange for the morning's experience, for I had felt the gratification of knowing I was putting to flight some hundreds of the enemy soldiers while enjoying the choicest hour of hunting I had ever experienced. Mr. Taylor invited me to accompany him to Baccarat, a small metropolis of that region of France, lying between Lunavie and Dijon. As we passed Lunavie and proceeded eastward, I again noticed the unusual tranquillity of this sector of the war zone. The British Independent Air Force had its hangars of large Handley Page bombing machines along this road. These huge aeroplanes carried bombs of high explosive, weighing 1,650 pounds each. Nightly, these squadrons flew over to the Rhine cities and laid their eggs in and about these railroad centers and factory localities. To my amazement, I discovered that this British aerodrome was but 12 miles behind the lines. The German rumplers came overhead every morning and photographed the field, but no attempts were made to destroy the Handley Page machines by either shelling from the lines or by aeroplane raids. The Germans are a funny people. As Mr. Taylor and I were scudding along over these smooth roads through the forest of the Vosges, we noticed a family of wild boars rooting in the edge of a field. We backed up the car, and I asked Mr. Taylor to be good enough to wait for me a minute while I went over and picked up one of these little pigs for a mascot for our squadron. He very kindly complied. I did not notice the expression on his face until I returned a few minutes later. Armed with my walking stick, I made a detour, so as to come upon the enemy and surprise them from their rear. My plans were to make a sudden attack and divert one of the youngsters from the formation, then close in upon him and complete the capture. My tactics were unusually successful, and I bore down upon my prize and was just stooping over to pick him up when I heard a rush from the rear. I hesitated for the fraction of a second. Old Mother Boar was about ten yards abaft my stern, and was peeking upon me at some sixty miles per hour. Further delay upon my part would have been a mistake. I performed a renversement, put on the sauce, and zoomed for the roadway at sixty-one miles per hour. Amid the enthusiastic cheers of Mr. Taylor, I successfully escaped the charge of the enraged enemy by putting myself through two or three virages en route to the car. 
the beast rushed by me, snorting fire from both forward guns, and covering me with a shower of dirt from her hoofs. I finally made a leap for the running board of the car, minus my walking stick, and a good deal of breath. "'What's the trouble, Rick?' inquired Taylor, enthusiastically. "'Did you come back to tell me something?' "'Yes,' I panted. "'I looked them over, and decided they were too young to be torn from their mother. Let's go on.' "'But you forgot your stick,' retorted Taylor. "'I'll wait for you while you go back and get it.' "'Oh, never mind the stick,' I answered. "'It didn't belong to me anyway.' A few weeks later, I had an opportunity to see how the French sportsmen proceed in their wild boar hunts. The mayor of a little French village invited several of us to come over one Sunday morning and take part in the hunt. By nine o'clock there were fully a hundred persons gathered together in the little plaza facing the village church. About twenty carried guns. The balance were duly sworn in by the mayor to act as beaters up. It was a very impressive ceremony, and the whole village stood by to witness the scene. After walking a mile or two through the woods, we were halted. The mayor addressed us, and gave explicit orders for further proceedings. There was one old boar in these woods, he informed us, who had now three dum-dum bullets inside his anatomy. He was a very tough and very dangerous customer. The mayor strongly advised us to first pick out a convenient tree and take our positions in its immediate vicinity. If the boar came along, we could take a shot at him, or not, just as we individually happened to view the situation. Personally, he advised us to climb the tree and let some other fellow do the shooting. The beaters up, who were all standing at attention, thereupon saluted and disappeared within the forest. We lighted our pipes and measured the distance to the adjacent overhanging limbs. For an hour nothing happened to relieve the monotony. Someone made the brilliant suggestion that we take our cartridges out of our rifles and make dum-dum bullets out of them. This we all did, thereby regaining something of our former jaunty composure. At last we heard hoots and yells from the forest. The party of beaters up were advancing towards us, beating the saplings with their sticks and uttering strange cries. I took a last glance at my tree overhead, and then crouched down to have a look between the tree trunks at the approaching enemy. It was a strange sight. There, not fifty feet in front of me, I saw a motley gathering of animals of all descriptions. Red foxes, black foxes, wild cats, two or three innocent-eyed deer, a number of partridges and grouse and quite a flock of wild boars stood stock still, gazing back at me. Not fifty feet in their rear came the village boys, hooting and yelling to let us know where not to shoot. They were bringing us our game along ahead of them like a flock of barnyard fowls. It seemed quite impossible to fire in that direction without inflicting casualties among the beaters up. I therefore continued staring at the animals until they tired of posing for me and turned their procession en masse towards the south. One of the Frenchmen shot a fox that Sunday morning, and we all returned to the village tavern for a glass of wine, highly delighted with the successful day's sport. The mayor especially congratulated us upon our fortunate escape from the savage wild boar. Upon my suggesting to his honor that his beaters up had occupied a somewhat dangerous position at the crucial moment for firing, he shook his head sorrowfully and replied, Yes, it is too true. They are unfortunately wounded at times. Then, clearing up his countenance, with a gleam of pride, he added, "'But they are good boys. They have accustomed themselves to the danger, and they do not shrink.' And thus is the great national sport of the Vosges carried on. Upon the occasional victory over the toothsome wild boar of the forest, a triumphant procession follows behind the champion, who strides gallantly through the village street, with his trophy hanging head down over his back. If the village is not too densely populated, every inhabitant within it dines upon a delicious meat that night. Chapter 18. Strafing the Draken Observation balloons, or draken, as the Bosch call them, constitute a most valuable method of espionage upon the movements of an enemy, and at the same time are a most tempting bait to pilots of the opposing fighting squadrons. They are huge in size, forming an elongated sausage some two hundred feet in length and perhaps fifty feet in diameter. They hang swinging in the sky at a low elevation, some two thousand feet or under, and are prevented from making any rapid movements of escape from aeroplane attack by reason of the long cable which attaches them to their mother truck on the highway below. These trucks, which attend the balloons, are of the ordinary size, a three-ton motor truck which steers and travels quite like any big lorry one meets on the streets. On the truck bed is fastened a winch which lets out the cable to any desired length. 
In case of an attack by shell fire, the truck simply runs up the road a short distance without drawing down the balloon. When it is observed that the enemy gunners have again calculated its range, another move is made, perhaps back to a point near its former position. Large as is its bulk, and as favorable and steady a target as it must present to the enemy gunners three miles away, it is seldom indeed that a hit from bursting shrapnel is recorded. These balloons are placed along the lines some two miles back of the front line trenches. From his elevated perch two thousand feet above ground, the observer can study the ground and pick up every detail over a radius of ten miles on every side. Clamped over his ears are telephone receivers. With his telescope to his eye, he observes and talks to the officers on the truck below him. They in turn inform him of any especial object about which information is desired. If our battery is firing upon a certain enemy position, the observer watches for the dropping of the shells and corrects the faults in aim. If a certain roadway is being dug up by our artillery, the observer notifies the battery when sufficient damage has been done to render that road impassable. Observation balloons are thus a constant menace to contemplated movements of forces, and, considered as a factor of warfare, they are of immense importance. Every fifteen or twenty miles along the front, both sides station their balloons, and when one chances to be shot down by an enemy airplane, another immediately runs up to take its place. Shelling by artillery fire being so ineffective, it naturally occurs to every airplane pilot that such a huge and unwieldy target must be easy to destroy from the air. Their cost is many times greater than the value of an airplane. They cannot fight back with any hope of success. All that seems to be required is a sudden dash by a swift fighting airplane, a few shots with flaming bullets, and the big gas bag burst into flames. What could be more simple? I had been victorious over five or six enemy airplanes at this time, and had never received a wound in return. This balloon business puzzled me, and I was determined to solve the mystery attending their continued service, in the face of so many hostile airplanes flying constantly in their vicinity. Accordingly, I lay awake many nights, pondering the stories I had heard about attacking these draken, planning just how I should dive in and let them have a quick burst, sheer off and climb away from their machine-gun fire, hang about for another dive, and continue these tactics until a sure hit could be obtained. I would talk this plan over with several of my pilots, and after working out all the details, we would try it on. Perhaps we could make 94 Squadron famous for its destruction of enemy balloons. There must be some way to do it, provided I picked out the right men for the job and gave them a thorough training. After discussing the matter with Major Atkinson, our commanding officer, who readily gave me his approval, I sought out Reed Chambers, Jimmy Meisner, Thorne Taylor, and Lieutenant Loomis. These four with myself would make an ideal team to investigate this proposition. First we obtained photographs of five German balloons in their lairs from the French observation squadron. Then we studied the map and ascertained the precise position each occupied, the nature of the land, the relative position of the mountains and rivers, the trees and villages in the vicinity of each, and all the details of their environment. One by one we visited these balloons, studying from above the nature of the roadway upon which their mother trucks must operate, the height of the trees above this roadway, and where the anti-aircraft defenses had been posted around each draken. These latter were the only perils we had to fear. We knew the reputation of these defenses, and they were not to be ignored. Since they alone were responsible for the defense of the balloons, we very well knew that they were unusually numerous and accurate. They would undoubtedly put up such a thick barrage of bullets around the suspended draken that an airplane must actually pass through a steady hailstorm of bullets both in coming in and in going out. Willie Coppins, the Belgian ace, had made the greatest success of this balloon strafing. He had shot down over a score of German drakens and had never received a wound. I knew he armed his airplane with flaming rockets, which penetrated the envelope of the gas bag, and burned there until it was ignited. This method had its advantages and its disadvantages, but another trick that was devised by Coppins met with my full approval. This was to make the attack early in the morning or late in the evening, when visibility was poor and the approach of the buzzing motor could not be definitely located. Furthermore, he made his attack from a low level, flying so close to the ground that he could not be readily picked up from above. As he approached the vicinity of his balloon, he zoomed quickly up and began his attack. If the balloon was being hauled down, he met it halfway. All depended upon the quickness of his attack and the sureness of his aim. 
on june twenty fifth nineteen eighteen my alarm clock buzzed me awake at two thirty o'clock sharp as i was the instigator of this little expedition i leaped out of bed with no reluctant regrets and leaned out of my window to get a glimpse of the sky it promised to be a fine day rousing out the other four of my party i telephoned to the hangars and ordered out the machines the guns had been thoroughly overhauled during the night and straight incendiary bullets had been placed in the magazines everything was ready for our first attack and we sat down to a hurried breakfast full of excitement and fervor the whole squadron got up and accompanied us to the hangars we were soon in our flying suits and strapped in our seats the motors began humming and then i felt my elation suddenly begin to leak out of me my motor was stubborn and would not keep up its steady revolutions upon investigation i found one magneto absolutely refused to function leaving me with but one upon which i could rely i debated within myself for a few seconds as to whether i should risk dropping into germany with a dud motor or risk the condolences of the present crowd which had gathered to see us off the former won in spite of my best judgment rather than endure the sarcasm of the onlookers and the disappointment of my team i prayed for one more visitation of my goddess of luck and gave the signal to start at four thirty o'clock we left the ground and headed straight into germany i had decided to fly eight or ten miles behind the lines and then turn and come back at the balloon line from an unexpected quarter trusting to the systematic discipline of the german army to have its balloons just beginning to ascend as we reached them each pilot in my party had his own balloon marked out each was to follow the same tactics we separated as soon as we left the field each man following the direction of his own course passing high over nancy i proceeded northward and soon saw the irregular lines of the trenches below me it was a mild morning and very little activity was discernible on either side not a gun was flashing in the twilight which covered the ground and as far as my eye could reach nothing was stirring it was the precise time of day when weary fighters would prefer to catch their last wink of sleep i hoped they would be equally deaf to the sounds of my early humming newport cutting off my motor at fifteen thousand feet over the lines i prayed once more that when the time came to switch on again my one magneto would prove faithful it alone stood between me and certain capture i could not go roaring over the sleeping heads of the whole german army and expect to preserve my secret by gliding quietly along with silent engine as I passed deeper and deeper within their territory, I could gradually lose my altitude and then turn and gain the balloon line with comparatively little noise. Keep your spunk up, Magneto boy, I sang to my engine as I began the fateful glide. I had a mental vision of the precise spot behind the enemy balloon where I should turn on my switch and there discover liberty or death. I would gladly have given my kingdom that moment for just one more little Magneto. At that moment I was passing swiftly over the little village of Guin. It was exactly five o'clock. The black outlines of the Bois de Fasse lay to my left, nestled along the two arms of the Moselle River. I might possibly reach those woods with a long glide if my motor failed me at the ultimate moment. I could crash in the treetops, hide in the forest until dark, and possibly make my way back through the lines with a little luck. Cheery thoughts I had as I watched the menacing German territory slipping away beneath my wings and then i saw my balloon the faithful fellows had not disappointed me at any rate conscientious and reliable men these germans were up and ready for the day's work at the exact hour i had planned for them i flattened out my glide a trifle more so as to pass their post with the minimum noise of singing wires a mile or two beyond them i began a wide circle with my nose well down it was a question of seconds now and all would be over i wondered how chambers and meisner and the others were getting on probably at this very instant they were jubilating with joy over the scene of a flaming bag of gas finding the earth rapidly nearing me i viraged sharply to the left and looked ahead there was my target floating blandly and unsuspiciously in the first rays of the sun the men below were undoubtedly drinking their coffee and drawing up orders for the day's work that would never be executed i headed directly for the swinging target and set my sights dead on its center there, facing me with rare arrogance in the middle of the balloon, was a huge Maltese cross, the emblem of the Bosch balloons. I shifted my rudder a bit and pointed my sights exactly at the center of the cross. Then I deliberately pressed both triggers with my right hand, while with my left I snapped on the switch. There must be some compartment in one's brain for equalizing the conflicting emotions that crowd simultaneously upon one at such moments as this. I realized instantly that I was saved myself, 
for the motor picked up with a whole-souled roar the very first instant after I made the contact. With this life-saving realization came the simultaneous impression that my whole morning's work and anguish were wasted. I saw three or four streaks of flame flash ahead of me and enter the huge bulk of the balloon ahead. Then the flames abruptly ceased. Flashing bullets were cutting a living circle all around me, too, I noticed. Notwithstanding the subtlety of my stalking approach, the balloon's defenders had discovered my identity and were all waiting for me. My guns had both jammed. This, too, I realized at the same instant. I had had my chance, had shot my bolt, was in the very midst of a fiery furnace that beggars description, and thanks to a benignant providence, was behind a lusty motor that would carry me home. Amid all these conflicting impressions, which surged upon me during that brief instant, I distinctly remembered that only one poignant feeling remained in my brain. I had failed in my mission. With the fairest target in the world before my guns, with all the risk already run and conquered, I had failed in my mission merely because of a stupid jamming of my guns. Automatically I swerved to the right of the suspended gas bag, and grazed helplessly by the distended sides of the enemy draken. I might almost have extended my hand and cut a hole in its sleek envelope, it occurred to me as I swept by. The wind had been from the east, so I knew that the balloon would stretch away from its supporting cable and leave it to the right. More than one balloon strafer has rushed below his balloon and crashed headlong into the inconspicuous wire cable which anchors it to the ground. I had planned out every detail with the utmost success. The only thing I had failed in was the expected result. Either the Bosch had some material covering their drakens that extinguished my flaming bullets, or else the gas which was contained within them was not as highly inflammable as I had been led to believe. Some three or four bullets had entered the sides of the balloon. Of this I was certain. Why had they failed to set fire to it? Later on, I was to discover that flaming bullets very frequently puncture observation balloons without producing the expected blaze. The very rapidity of their flight leaves no time for the ignition of the gas. Often, in the early dawn, the accumulated dews and moisture in the air serve so to dampen the balloon's envelope that hundreds of incendiary bullets penetrate the envelope without doing more damage than can be repaired with a few strips of adhesive plaster. As I doggedly flew through the fiery curtain of German bullets and set my nose for home, I was conscious of a distinct feeling of admiration for the Belgian Willie Coppins. And since he had demonstrated that balloon strafing had in fact a possibility of success, I was determined to investigate this business until I too had solved its mysteries. Then I began to laugh to myself at an occurrence that, until then, I had had no time to consider. As I began firing at the sausage, the German observer, who had been standing in his basket under the balloon, with his eyes glued to his telescope, had evidently been taken entirely by surprise. The first intimation he had of my approach was the bullets which preceded me. At the instant he dropped his telescope, he dived headlong over the side of his basket with his parachute. He did not even pause to look around to see what danger threatened him. Evidently, the mother truck began winding up the cable at the same time, for as the observer jumped for his life, the balloon began to descend upon him. I caught the merest glimpse of his face as I swept past him, and there was a mingled look of terror and surprise upon his features that almost compensated me for my disappointment. On my way homeward, I flew directly towards a French observation balloon that swung on the end of its cable in my path. Without considering the consequences of my act, I sheered in and passed quite close to the Frenchman who was staring at me from his suspended basket. Suddenly the froggy leaped headlong from his perch, and clutching his parachute rope with his two hands, began a rapid descent to earth. And not until then did I realize that coming directly at him, head on from Germany as I did, he had no way of reading my cuckards which were painted underneath my wings. He had decided that I was a Bosch, and did not care to take any chances at a jump with a blazing gas bag about his ears. Fortunately for me, the French gunners below could read my bright insignias from the ground, and they suffered me to pass, without taking any revenge for the trick I had played upon their comrade. Arriving at the aerodrome at 5.45, I found that I was the last of my little party of balloon strafers to land. The other four were standing together, looking rather sheepishly in my direction as I walked towards them. "'Well, what luck?' I inquired as I came up to them. Nobody spoke. "'I thought I saw a big blaze over in your direction, Jimmy.' I went on, addressing myself to Lieutenant Meisner. Did you get him? No, replied Jimmy disgustedly. The balloon was not up in the air at all. I didn't get a sight of it. 
I didn't even see where they had hidden it. "'Did you get yours, Reed?' I asked, turning to Chambers. "'Hell no!' retorted Lieutenant Chambers emphatically. "'I shot the thing full of holes, but she wouldn't drop.' The other two pilots had much the same stories. One had failed to find his balloon, and the other had made an attack, but it had brought no results. All had been subjected to a defensive fire that had quite reversed their opinions of the Archibald family. "'I suppose you burned yours all right, Rick.' said Reed Chambers rather enviously as we walked up to the mess together. What do you think of us fellows anyway? I think, Reed, replied I, that we are the rottenest lot of balloonatical fakers that ever got up at two-thirty in the morning. But I am happy to discover, I added, thinking of my one puny magneto, that none of us had to land in Germany. 